we introduced the concept of, or, of, or an objective, I suppose, of trying to reconcile uh, two different views about the judgment seat. We talked about this shorter view, which is based on, on recognition, um, pretty much based on the parable of the sheep and the goats that would imply that the judgment seat is a very quick process. Someone's a sheep or someone's a goat. They're recognized as such by the Lord and there's a culling process that's very quick in, in, in its outworking. And then a longer view that implies there is a giving of account of one's life and then at the end of that process a decision is made and that would be closely related to the parable of the, the talents and the pounds. We noted that we have these two different views, but there also are um, features and elements of parables that need to be reconciled as well. We noted that in the parable of the field, for example, or the parable of the vineyard, or the parable of the penny a day, everyone receives the same reward in that particular parable. Yet in the parable of the pounds, the parable of the talents, there is this proportional reward concept. So we're going to try and sort of gel those up as well. What, what, why is that the case? We talked about this, the, the quick recognition um, depicted in the sheep and goat parable as opposed to a, a detailed account uh, given in the other parables as well. I also introduced this little um, sort of dichotomy here that we want to sort of explore a bit further as our week progresses, where in one instance Paul is expressing uh, undoubtable confidence in, in receiving a crown of life. A very famous quote there in 2 Timothy 4. Um, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, not only to me, but all those that love his appearing. With this interesting little section here in 1 Corinthians 4, where Paul seems to say he won't know exactly the outcome of his behavior and his life and and the divine estimate of what he's done until the judgment seat. We're thinking, well, that's interesting. Paul is anticipating learning at the judgment seat about whether his actions have been right. He, he thinks they are in his conscience, but he said, I can't judge that. I'm not yet justified, and I don't know yet. The Lord will reveal the hidden things, and I'll find out then. But on the other hand, he's quite confident of receiving eternal life in the, in, at the judgment seat. So we need to try and balance those concepts out. And I suppose that, that's going to be a little litmus test, that one there particularly on our last session. Hopefully I'll, I'll get some feedback from the audience to see if you feel that you can, you can tell the difference in those passages and try and reconcile them together. So keep, keep that in mind. I suggested an idea to try and reconcile not just those two different views, but also the the, the overriding principles of salvation and the atonement and justification that we saw in our very first session, an idea that tries to, to bring all those concepts together and make them consistent by saying that instead of seeing these as two different views that are mutually exclusive or two alternative views, to see them as stages or phases, if you like, of the judgment seat process itself. And tonight we want to flesh that out a little bit more by putting some scripture around that, that concept. Can we sort of see in Scripture this, this two or this dual activity taking place at the judgment seat? A, a recognition of the Lord's own with a detailed account uh, attached to that uh, that follows. And, and, and a decoupling uh, to some degree of the detailed account with the um, bestowal of, of, of immortality. So that's, that's sort of where we want to go over the next few nights or next few sessions. So we've said let's, let's look at these different views as different stages. Stage one being a shorter event where the Lord recognizes us and a longer view where our lives are reviewed and our motives are, are read, uh, etc. We also suggested this concept that the judgment seat, rather than being a forensic examination for the benefit of the judge, as our court system is and the way we would understand a, a, a human judgment to go. Even the word itself is taken from uh, the, the legal system of, of you know, ancient Rome and ancient Greece where the judge had no idea of the outcome of the, 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 the examination. Um, two people would come to him and he would hear the case from 
different perspectives and he'd make a decision at the end of the process. Is, is, does that paradigm really, really explain the judgment seat? And I don't, we don't, I don't think it does. Let's see the judgment seat rather as an education process rather than a judicial process. And that's, that's the sort of change in thinking when we look at the judgment seat that I believe helps reconcile the whole judgment seat um, parables and, and things together. As we said, the analogy of a human court doesn't really hold up. There's, there's a lot of differences and a lot of fundamental differences in what is taking place at the judgment seat. The judge already knows us intimately. Um, you know, Psalm 139 would indicate he's known us before we were born. You know, his, our actions are all written in his book. We're already declared righteous, deemed to be righteous by him. Um, so that's, that's, that's fundamentally different than a, than a human court scenario. And then we went our eyes down the, uh, that, that wonderful Romans 8 chapter and we saw this, this little section here where the question is asked, who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And the court scenario, the, the court analogy seems to be, um, to, to be excluded when you, when you look at it like this, that God's not laying charges as such. Um, God's the one who justifies us or makes the pronouncement that we're righteous. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is not laying charges. He's the one who makes intercession for us. He's our advocate or our defense counsel, if you like. So, so who, is, who is making the, the accusation as such? Again, I know reading big slabs from books is, is, can be a bit boring, so, but, but this is a very fundamental um, concept and I want to I make it as clear as possible. This is from Brother H.P. Mansfield's um, uh, articles on the judgment seat and I think the concepts in this, ar this article really will help fine-tune where we're going. If we get some of, the, some of the terms that he uses and some of the concepts, it'll hopefully for some crystallise the ideas as we try and uh, flesh them out. So I'll read this through. The question is asked in this article, is it not a clumsy contrivance to set up a judgment seat? Question mark. It, 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 like, that's a fair question. It seems, seems a bit clumsy for, a, for the God who created this universe, who knows the very hairs on our head, who knows our thoughts before they even are formed on our, you know, the words before they're informed on our tongue, to set up a human-like judgment seat. It's sort of, it's sort of almost, it's got a lot of, you know, it's, it's very human. And, and, and the question is asked, is, that, is it sort of too clumsy for this divine architect of the universe to, to do that? Um, does not Yahweh already know the righteous from the wicked? That's a fair question as well. Does Christ have to review our lives to determine we, whether we are worthy of reward or not? That's a good question as well. Does he really need to review Darren's life? To, it, surely that, that doesn't seem right when you look at an omniscient, omnipotent you know, God. Many speak like this and thus give evidence that they do not appreciate the real purpose of the judgment seat. That's what we want to put our finger on tonight. Actually, the appearance of believers before the judgment seat is the final act of mercy on the part of a gracious God, now this is really important, designed to fit them for the kingdom. So instead of seeing the judgment seat as a probative, judicial, interrogative you know, investigation, we're now seeing it as an education process. If we look inwards, we will recognize that we are not fit for association with Christ or for the bestowal of divine glory. We all get that. We are conscious of our failings. We constantly sin, often in the same way. And I think that's where a lot of our doubt comes from, doesn't it? Sometimes I, sometimes I find it easy to comprehend you know, sitting like David in some massive big sin and going to God in tears and, 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 and contrition and promising to God I'll never do that again and never doing that again. I, I can understand God forgiving me for that sort of thing, like a big event, more so than the, the stupidity of my everyday existence. That's, that's I think, where I struggle with understanding God's mercy. Um, true, we bear these up to the Father, our sins. We plead his forgiveness and strive to correct our faults. But then again, in off-guarded moments, our weakness is again made manifest. Moreover, 
we are not always cognizant of our weaknesses. This is interesting now. So, so we sin, so we have that problem, we recognize where we fail, but there's many times we don't even know we sin. If we believe that we are, let us consider our brethren. Look around the hall at each other. Do not we observe faults that they reveal? Yes, we do. We can see it very easily in everyone else. It's so easy to see failings in others, so difficult to recognize them in us. The appearance of us all before the judgment seat of Christ will reveal us for what we are in the sight of God. How does Yahweh accomplish this? It's a process that begins when a person first comes to a knowledge of the truth in Christ Jesus and will continue until he stands before the judgment seat of Christ. By this process, flesh is humbled and the individual's character is perfected for the bestowal of life eternal. I think some of the concepts that are in that article really capture the real purpose of the judgment seat. Not so much an investigation to let the judge make a decision, but an identification of our failings and an education process to fit us for immortality. And we know that's that we know we need that, don't we? I, you do not want to give Darren to poor as immortality. I, I'm assuring you, as, as I am now, if, if Christ came and forgave me and accepted me in the kingdom and then gave me immortality, that, that would be horrific. There's education still needed. There are blind spots in my character, in my understanding. There are prejudices. There are all things that need to be dealt with. Where, where does that get dealt with? You know, we're, we're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Our physical body's changed. Where are all those misconceptions that I have and those, those, those issues that I have that maybe everyone else can see and I don't even see in myself? Where are they fixed? Where are they dealt with? And this is where the judgment seat comes into play. Let's just go to our reading tonight in 1 Corinthians 3. And we get an insight into this, I suppose, dual aspect here of the judgment seat that we're trying to trace through. 1 Corinthians 3, just a bit of context. Um, Paul is dealing with a very immature uh, attitude that the, these believers had, extremely immature, so much so he says in verse 1, you know, you, you, I can't even speak to you as, as spiritual, but you're very carnal, very immature in the, in the way you're dealing with things. Does everyone know what carnal means? Carnal? where we get the word carnivorous from, okay, flesh-eating animals. For the foodies, it's where chili con carne comes from. So, just, so carne has the idea of, of, of meat and flesh. So it's, it's talking about our, our, our natural body. And, and, and these brothers and sisters in this immature state, in this immature attitude, were exhibiting natural fleshly tendencies. And it was seen in this faction um, uh, concept that was shown here. He says in verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for there is among you envying and strife and division. Are you not carnal and walk as men? It's just, just normal human, fallen human behavior, really. Um, he says, and he explains what he means in verse 4. One says, I'm of Paul. So they stand behind, I'm, 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 I belong to Paul. Another says, I, I belong to Apollos. He says, that sort of attitude's carnal, it's immature, it's not spiritual at all. He says in verse 5, Who, who's Paul, who's Apollos? But they're, they're ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now, he's going to address this issue of, of looking at the leaders and standing behind the leaders and almost thinking that by identifying yourself with one of these great men, one of these leaders, that there was something that, that rubbed off onto you, that you somehow benefited from standing behind one of these, these, these great spiritual giants. I don't think the chapter's having a go at the leaders themselves. The, cha the, 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 the chapter is having a go at or dealing with the immature brothers and sisters. And he now talks about the relationship between them and the leaders, if you like, that have, that have brought the truth to them that they were now using as these sort of banners to stand behind. He says in verse 6, I have planted and Apollos watered. So there's, th th these two men weren't in competition. They weren't sort of, you know, different leaders of different factions. Paul planted. He, he had a gift in a way for breaking new ground and he was able to go to new places and, 
and, and take the gospel to brand new places. That was a, Paul's incredible gift. Uh, it, it, he was able to do that. Apollos was a, a, a good speaker, a good orator, and, and, and was able to explain God's word. And he would come later on and he would water, he would help grow the, 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 the flock that Paul had uh, brought into the truth. So they weren't competing with each other. They were using their gifts that they had in a, in a sort of a harmonious way. Now, this is the phrase I want us just to think about quickly in verse 6. I've planted, Paul, Paul's, so I've thrown the seed out there, some of it's caught in good ground. Apollos has come along and watered, nurtured that. But, now this is fundamental to our whole week together, God gave the increase. And he repeats this in verse 7. So neither is he that plants anything, really, don't, don't stand behind the one planting. Neither he that waters, but God gives the increase. I say this because it goes back to our very first session about viewing our baptism and our conversion, our baptism, in a much greater and a, and a higher status than we sometimes think. When we are converted and we are baptized into Christ, we've not just joined an organization. You know, it's, it's far more grand what has happened when God's words come into our hearts. And our faith, yes, it's, it's, it's undeveloped and untried, etc. but it's still a miracle that has happened. And same it was to these believers who were still immature, but God's word had come into their minds, into their hearts, and it had sprung and, 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 and something had happened. God gives the increase. It's not the, the, the brains of the brother you know, at my ecclesia who took me through for baptism and explained all the rested scriptures or, or the, the, the other wonderful brother who did this or that, like Paul and Apollos. They contributed to it. They're, they're ministers. They're servants in this process. But God gave the increase, you see. A miracle happened when I came into the truth. I'm part of the chess head of Yahweh at that point. I'm part of the covenant people as our, as our chairman. So we're, we're, we're now in Christ. A real thing has happened, a real thing, uh, which we should never minimize. God has given the increase. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, Now he that plants and he that waters are one. They're both a team working together with their different gifts. And every man, this phrase will run all the way through this chapter, every man has to answer for themselves. They don't stand behind a leader. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So, so that, that's very clear, I think. You don't, you don't piggyback on someone else. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Then he uses two metaphors here. First one is, you are his, the, the King James has husbandry, husbandry, which is a little bit confusing. Um, New King James has, you are his field. Or in other translations have, you, you are his meadow. That's probably a better way to think of it. You are God's meadow. You are God's field. So we are all plants that have sprung up in God's field. That's a miracle, isn't it? When, when you put a dead seed into the ground and it, and, it, and it springs up to life, you know, literally life comes into effect. As we saw in our first session, spiritual life has come into effect. When we were baptized, we were once dead in trespasses and sins, we were raised by, by Christ and our sins and our transgressions were forgiven. There's life come into us, spiritual life. And, and that is a miracle in itself. So you are God's field. Paul has planted, whoever planted in our own individual case, someone's planted the seed in us. Others have come along and watered. And, and germination has happened. A birth has happened. And we are now part of God's field. That's, that's all of us. That's just amazing. That he moves now from an agricultural metaphor, which is a very powerful metaphor, but it's, it, it's not going to get us all the way there in this chapter and, and, and get the lesson that Paul's making. So he, he switches from this, this garden metaphor to an architectural metaphor. And he says, you are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. And the building's got more elements to it that he can demonstrate some additional spiritual lessons. And this is where we're going to look at now. It says in verse 10, According to the grace of God which is given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded thereon. But let every man, there's that term every man, let every man take heed or take care how he builds thereon. 
Now he talks about the foundation. The foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In a sense, the foundation in these two metaphors, the foundation is probably equivalent to the field. When we, when we, when we germinate in that field, in God's spiritual field, we, we come to life in Christ. We are now in the foundation. This is why the, the field metaphor needs some, something extra. We've got a foundation, which is Christ. The foundation is Christ. We are in Christ. We are in the foundation. So keep that in mind. Then he says, now if any man, repeating that phrase again, if any man build upon this foundation, so we are all in Christ, we are all in the foundation, which is Christ, but we build upon that foundation using uh, different building materials, and he lists them in sort of descending order from valuable down to, to less valuable, to worthless. So you've got gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. It's interesting here, he doesn't, he, doesn't say, he doesn't put the word all in there. He doesn't say gold or silver or precious stone. Or, he, he lists them all with a, you know, in, in, in our English, we've got a, just a comma in between, I think, in most translations. To me, that's sort of saying that all of us will build a house in our life on the foundation of being in Christ. And none of us will have a pure gold house or a pure precious stone house. Our houses are going to be mixed to a, to a degree of different things that, that, that make up our spiritual house. So just to recap, we've got this foundation, which is Jesus Christ. We are his building. We are in that foundation. Now, that's a really fundamental thing to keep in your mind. We build on that foundation using gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. This foundation, we're going to see in a moment, is God's work. Remember when Paul said, I, I plant Apollos waters, but God gives the increase. The foundation is equivalent to that. We are in the foundation through grace, through the work of God. And it's a miracle. It's, a, it's, it's the power of God unto salvation that has brought us into that process. However, there's a superstructure above, built on top of that, of that reality. And that is our own doing, our own work, or ergon if in, in the Greeks, our own contribution to this process, which is really, really important. I just want to highlight the use of this term, every man, that runs through the chapter. In fact, it goes right back to chapter 1 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1. Um, he says, every man of you says, I'm Paul, I'm Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. The only reason I, I highlight this, and I haven't got time tonight to dwell on it, but there, there are some who have expounded this chapter and say it's talking about uh, leaders and teachers in the truth and not about all of us. It's just referring to leaders and teachers. I don't think that's right. And I've written a paper on that if you, if you want to pursue that more. But to me, it's the, the, the structure of the Greek and following the argument right through Corinthians, he's talking about every man. He's saying it's not the leader's fault that this has happened. The leader's are doing their job. Paul's preaching and Cephas is teaching and, and everyone, they're, they're, they're not to blame in this. You carnal Corinthians are to blame. And everyone will get a, a response from God based on their own work. And this is really the emphasis here of, of what's been said. So, we build using gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay or stubble. It's our work, every man's work. It's what we contribute to this, to this particular house. Then, if, let's just read on. Let's go and pick it up in verse, well, verse 12. We just read about the gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work, there's our term, every man. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Now, this is, we're going to look at this word in our exhortation on Sunday, God willing. It's the word fanaru. Okay, it's like to, be, to reveal, to open up and to examine. Every man's work is going to be manifest. It's going to be, it's a, this is a judgment seat word. For the day, now some translations, I think the ESV uh, and IV have got the word day with a capital D at the front, which I, I think is quite right. The day, you know, Romans 2, for example, the day when God judges us, the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So this is, this is 
the concept. The fire will try every man's work. All these phrases are judgment seat terms. All these the idea of trying, um, etc., and revealing and and manifesting. All, all these are judgment seat terms. Now, look at the scenario that Paul paints here. He says, "Every man's work." Uh, shall be manifest. Verse 14. If any man's work abide, which really means to survive, if any man's work survives, he shall receive reward. If any man's works work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. That word burned, I just want you to be aware of this because this, this is very important for our understanding here. The word burned uh, means, this is from Strong's definition here, to burn down to the ground, that is to consume wholly, burned up utterly. And most of the other translations have burnt up to capture the meaning of that word. It's not singed, it's not partially burnt. There are other Greek words that could have conveyed that idea. This word means completely consumed, burnt to the ground, burnt right down. Okay. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to, to illustrate this little process here. I've got the safety goggles on, so the safety committee can be okay here. Here we've got a foundation. It's very solid, indestructible foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. You are God's building. You are in that foundation. You are in Christ. On top of the foundation, we've built thereupon. And we've used different building materials in our life. There are probably times in our life where we've used gold. Gold, silver, and precious stones would indicate things that are rare, things that are valuable from, from God's perspective. You know, the meek and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight, precious. So there's, there's a precious stone, if you like. Where we've turned the other cheek. When someone's criticised us or, or, or said something bad to us or nasty, we've turned the other cheek, we've, we've been a peacemaker, um, we've stood up for God's principles, wherever it might be, we've acted in a gold way or a silver or, or precious stone. They're, they're rare and they're not common to man. The other building materials we could have used are common. You find them everywhere, wood, hay and stubble. They're easy, accessible, cheap. You don't have to go to a lot of trouble. There's no real sacrifice needed. They're laying all over the place. Wood, hay, and stubble. Just pick it up off the ground. And it will denote human behaviors. You know, factionism, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 3 there. Uh, responding angrily when we're criticized. Seeking vainglory and pride. And all, all these things that are just common, human, carnal way of doing things. We can build our house... Gold, silver, or stubble, uh, sorry, gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. We may have deluded ourselves as to the quality of our building material in our life as well. And we think we're built with gold, and we might find out at the judgment seat that's not necessarily the case. So here's, here's Darren's house, my little house built on the foundation. So, On the day, my work will be tested by fire. The Lord will say, how have you built your house, Darren? And I'll say things like, well, I visited Cumberland in 2017 and did some studies for them. That's, that, that sounds like gold, doesn't it? That's a, isn't that a gold thing? And the Lord will say, well, yeah, but you did a lot of that just to show everyone how spiritual you were and, and uh, how much you... You love studying the Bible, and you did a lot of that for your own, for your own self. There was a lot of wood, hay, and stubble in that in that act. And there's a bit of truth in that. Um, I hope it's a bit of truth, anyway. I hope it's not all the truth. Or I may say to my Lord, I'm very hospitable at my ecclesia. I invite everyone home, even those who can't invite me back. And and, and I think isn't that a gold? Isn't that a gold thing? And might be said, you just like food, that's why you invite everyone back to your house. That's a very carnal thing as well. But you can see the process that's happening, can't you? All, all those things that I've built um, are being put under the torch. 
to see whether they really are the gold that I think they are. And of course, there'll be stubble in there that I will oh, know it's stubble, I knew it's stubble before, but the Lord will reveal that. And that will sort of reveal what I used to build my house with. Now, just so I don't set the alarms off in here, I'll just put that out. Now, let's read on, though. Swap glasses. Let's read on. So we saw, if any remains, which the word is survives, there's rewards. And we're going to talk about that in our next session, what that means. But for now, just keep that in the back of your mind. If it survives, there's rewards. If it's burned up, fully burned up and consumed, at the end of the day, that house has been fires applied to it and all the things in the truth that I thought were gold and the way I acted and the way I dealt as an arranging brother and the way I, I, I dealt, did, you know, brought up my family, all these things, and the Lord applies the torch to it and says, there's no real serious gold in here. There's a lot of, there's, there's, it's so mixed with stubble that it's taken on the character of stubble and, and wood and hay and it's all burnt. And that's what the word here in the Greek says, fully burnt. Verse 14. If any man's work survives which he is built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned up, he shall suffer loss. But, now this is where it gets interesting, he himself shall be saved. Why? What wasn't burnt? Anyone want to yell it out? What wasn't burnt? The foundation wasn't burnt, was it? I am in that foundation. I am God's field. I am in the foundation which is Christ. I am in Christ. My house might be burnt to, to smithereens, but I am in Christ. Therefore, I'm still saved, yet it's a painful process that I'm going through as my inner motives and my inner uh, reasons for why I did things is revealed to the Lord and he, and he, and he opens all those things up. Here's a, an extract from uh, Brother Norris's book, Acts and the Epistles, and he explains this. He says, there will be special blessings for those who will then have been found to have built durably, like with materials that survive the fire. Even for the remainder, salvation is not to be denied, but there will be the inevitable shame and sorrow of having one's faults exposed by the purifying fire of the Lord's presence. It seems plain that no one can be made perfect on that day without his residual faults being made known to him and then admitted and purged. Most of God's servants will have blemishes uncorrected beforehand which much must be brought to life. light. Sorry. And he quotes from Luke 12, which we'll look at on Thursday night. Some will receive few stripes and some will receive many stripes and we've got, to, we've got to try and get our head around what that means in the context of the judgment seat so we'll, we'll come back to that idea as we've sort of said uh, in our earlier sessions the judgment seat then is not something different and remote and unconnected to what God's doing in our life now it is in fact the final process of what God is doing in our lives right this moment you know, it's through much tribulation we enter the kingdom of God and our faith is strengthened and purified and refined by, by fire and trial. And these things are happening to us and to many of you far more intensely than me at the moment. But all of us go through these things and our faith is, is developed in this process. That's the way God works. The judgment seat isn't something outside of that. It is a continuation. It is an intense, accelerated version of that that takes place so that we can then be given immortality at the after the judgment seat is, is complete and these residual um, things are, are, are fixed. And then we are presented faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. That presenting faultless, it's of course echoed back to the, you know, the burnt offering, etc., and, 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 the, and the, the, the means without blemish. Um, it, 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 it will be done morally in the sense that God will deem us he will deem us without blemish. But surely more is needed than just that. There has to be a change in, our, in some of our attitudes, our thoughts, our, our perspectives. That has to be rectified. And, and by bringing into the judgment seat process behaviours and things that we have said and things that we have done in our previous life, 
Those things will be used to illustrate where we have chinks and where we have rough edges and where we have things that need to be dealt with by our Lord. Even though they might have been forgiven, even though they are forgiven, if they indicate a pattern of behaviour, then the Lord will bring them out and we will have to answer for those things. So these are some of the things that the Lord will deal with. You know, where we've got emotional overreactions, as we, know, we all know family members and friends who, who overreact and, and, the, and their, their responses to issues and the, how they deal with conflict is far off the mark when you compare it to, say, the Sermon on the Mount and how we should deal with things. And, and they have these issues. And, and there's often... I'm not trying to be pop psychologist and say, you know, we can blame our upbringing for everything. I'm not saying that at all. But we are products of, we are without, whether we like it or not, we are products of, of our upbringing. We're products of our genetics. We're products of our ecclesial environment. We're products of all sorts of things that, that add and contribute to the way we see the world and the way we view things and the way we treat other people. There, there's a lot of things that we have that we don't even know that need to be rectified before immortality could surely be given to us. Inferiority complexes, you know, a lot of conflict in the truth in, in my experience, in my ecclesial experience and, and the sort of environment that I've been involved with comes from people just feeling like they're not being listened to, feeling like no one cares about them, that their, their, their perspective is not being taken into account. There's a lot, a lot of these emotional underlying issues that lead to bad behaviour and lead to, to other things that occur. The Lord will deal with all those things. Some of us might have hereditary things like, like that anger and and other things. Double standards. Who of us doesn't have double standards where we apply um, certain values and, 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 and judgments about one thing and, and there, there are contravening uh, items that we ignore and don't worry about. Partiality. The way we treat our own friends, our own family, uh, in contrast to how we might treat others that are not part of our group. Prejudices. Those of us who lack generosity and a lot of that can be just you know, how we've been brought up. Some people were very generous because they've had wonderful examples of generosity. Others have not had that example and, and, and lacked that. And, and, and although they struggle with it and try to deal with it, there's, there's, there's so much of what we do that, that um, needs to be dealt with. In, 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 and at some stage, it has to be dealt with. And the judgment seat is that, is that place. Then, of course, we're going to be praised for things at the judgment seat. We'll touch on that Thursday night. Something we don't really think about much, being praised at the judgment seat. Our, our focus on the judgment seat is all about getting in or, get, or being rejected. That's, that's sort of this, this sort of binary approach. We're either in or out and we're not going to make it. And You know, there's, there's more layers to the judgment seat. There's, it's more, there's more to it than just that. And, and the judgment seat is going to delve into problem areas, but it's also going to, the, the Lord is going to praise us for things that we have done right in our life and things we have uh, shown honour to him. Okay, we just, we've got to move on because I'm running out of time. I have one more issue to just flesh out a little bit that also reflects this similar concept. The Book of Life. We hear a lot about the Book of Life from, and, and we read about it from time to time. It comes up in a number of different scriptures. Asking the question, is the Book of Life a book of your life? So there's a Book of Life that's got all about Darren's life. You know, I did this, I came into the truth, baptised then, did this, did it, did it, and it's got all times, everything I've, where I've sinned, where I've done good. Is it the book of life, a, a, a detailed account of my life? Or is the book of life a book that's got um, all the names of those who will receive life, who will be given life by God? Which one is it? I won't make you put your hand up, but just think in your mind, which, which way do you, do you lean on that? Is, which book is it the detailed account of your life, or is it a book with all those who are to be saved? Now, if the book of life is a book of names, so in that book of life, it's the names of all those who are going to be saved, that would then support the short view of the judgment seat, the, the, the sheep and the goats concept, wouldn't it? Your name's in the book or it's not in the book. It's in the book. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're, you're, you're in the kingdom. You're a goat. You move, <laughs> sheep, sorry, you move to the right side. Okay, that's, 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 that, would, that would support that, that view to some degree. If the book is an a book of events that has all your life details, that would seem to indicate that, that when that book is used at the judgment seat, that there is more delving and more analysis done in your life. So our view on the book will sort of reflect our view of the judgment seat, which view we find acceptable. I love this one. 
This is like a little pre precursor to the Holy Spirit gifts being given later on, of course, in the in the book of Acts. But the apostles are sent out, or well, the disciples are sent out two by two, and had this ability to heal and, and to cast out demons. And they get a lot of publicity. You know, it would attract a lot of attention. So they, they, you know, it's it's quite a pretty big, obvious and public thing that they're doing. It's quite, imagine the, the ability to heal people. And they come back and they're all, would appear, they're all very excited about this thing and they're rejoicing. And Jesus sort of says, that's all well and good that you're able to do that and you've got recognition and people saw you making these and performing these miracles. We said, rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. Now, that, that is an amazing concept. He says, that, when you sit down and think about it, that is really what should generate joy and rejoicing in you. Remember, this, the apostles at this point are very immature. They're fighting about who's going to be greatest and all. Oh, they're very immature. They still would leave the Lord and, and flee at the time of crisis. They, they still had a lot to learn. But even then, their names were still written in heaven at that point, which is, which is quite, quite amazing. So I put that one down as their names written or enrolled in, in heaven, if you like. Philippians 4. Okay, what do, you, what do you want to suggest for that one? Names again. That is a fascinating story in itself. You know that little drama that runs through Philippians. You've got Euodius and Syntyche. They're sort of very dominant personalities. They're rubbing up against each other, obviously. There seems to be conflict in the ecclesia between these two dominant personalities. Far from the attitude of the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? Far from the attitude that, you know, the true spiritual attitude that they should have. And yet, in this, in this story here in, in Philippians 4 verse 2, so there's, there's this conflict going on and there's exhortation about being like-minded and, and getting over this conflict. Yet, even with this conflict and this less than, you know, less than ideal and less than what we might even say acceptable behaviour going on with this, this conflict that's taking place in the ecclesia, their names are still written in the book of life. They are still in Christ. They're still in the foundation. That, that's a fundamental concept, isn't it? They are still in the book of life. Yes, they would learn, God willing, about their behavior, and they would hopefully uh, modify that and make it more in alignment with the requirements of the Lord. But even still, they're in the book of life there. And you can read Brother Barling's book on Philippians for more information about that. Revelation 3. Blot out, what does that sort of denote? It says blot out the, the names concept, isn't it? All right, let's finish up in Revelation chapter 20. We'll, we'll look up the last one together. So I just want to give it some emphasis. Now, this is a judgment seat scene, but it's talking about the second judgment. So it's, it's a judgment that happens after the millennium at the end of the thousand years. But we could assume that the principles here would be universal, would apply um, to the first judgment as well. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, that's a plural S if you're wondering what that silly noise was, the books were opened, and another book, that's a singular K, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Okay, this is interesting. So there's, there's, there's two sets of books here. We've got books plural that contain works and we've got a book singular that we'll get to in a minute that is part of the judgment process. Now, because we run out of time, this, run your eyes down to verse, uh, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Salvation or rejection was based on the book, whether you were in the book of life or not. But judgment still involved books. Your, the works, what you had done in your life and what you had not done and what, where you had failed. Both of those are used at the judgment and both of them contribute to the whole judgment seat process. So, books for works and a book called the book of life. The books 
contain a book, Darren Taporis' book of my life. Um, whatever literal form that takes in the, in, the, in, the, in the mind of the spirit, I don't know, but there's a record, of, at least, of, of, of my life. The long view would, would support the idea of a record of my life. The short view would be supported by the idea of a book, a singular book that had whether you're in or out of the book. The book's concept has the idea of works or is about works. The book is linked to the verdict, whether you are in the lake of fire or not, whether you are saved or not, is linked to the book, singular. We've got works from the books. We've got grace from the book. We've got a parallel to the parable of the talents with the works and the books. We've got a parallel to the sheep and the goats with the, the verdict made and the selection made of the sheep and the goats. And we've also got a connection with the house being connected to the, the books of our life. That's all our works that the torch is applied to. And the foundation there connected to or analogous with the foundation, which is, which is Christ, which is quite interesting. So it appears at baptism, when we accept Christ and, and we are baptized in obedience to God, we are in the book of life as a default. That is the default setting. We are in the chesed of Yahweh. We are in the relation, the covenant relationship with, with God at that time. And we are commanded to walk in the light, to abide in him. All these in words that we saw in our first session that, that sort of epitomize that, that relationship. Yet, we can put ourselves outside of that. Um, our name can be removed, as we saw in some of those examples. The, um, the golden calf, for example, and, and uh, the, the names can be removed. Uh, Revelation 3 and the other references there talk about the name being removed. So your name can be removed because of behavior, of, of moving away from the, the truth of the gospel, um, acting in a way that's inconsistent in a, in a, in, with the covenant uh, principles. Judas went out into the darkness. You know, that denotes the idea. He went out of that, out of the light. He was no longer walking in the light. The prodigal son went out, out of the family environment, out into the world, and then eventually, of course, he, he returns back in that story. So you've got this idea that we are in the book of life as the default setting, as the, the, the call of the gospel is really good news. It's, it's amazing news. You believe, you're baptized, and you are in Christ. That is the incredible news that the Bible offers. So, as we said on our first evening, the normal view of the judgment seat that I had and, and had written plays on and all sorts of things was this idea that we give account first, we receive praise or admonition, and then we're accepted or rejected as a result of that. If we just change one of those elements around, I believe all the different scriptures that we listed in our earlier sessions can be, can be harmonized. If we are accepted or rejected like the sheep and the goats, like the book of life, if we then have to give account and then we receive praise or admonition. Now just to finish up, to try and illustrate what this means, Brother Chairman, do you mind just sitting, just sit there, you don't have to do anything, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge you if that's okay. Sorry if I just give you a little judgment. We're just going to have a little judgment here. Let's pretend I'm a, a rich Roman lord. It's just one of my little dreams I have. Uh, and I've got a massive property and lots of servants walking for me, working for me. And I have this little tradition that uh, if my servants are faithful and they work, they work for me uh, in a faithful and dedicated way, I take one of these slaves that has no life, no, no hope for the future. I elevate them and I give them their own farm and I let them marry and raise children and they can have an incredibly wonderful life. Give them freedom. They become redeemed, free, and they've got their own farm. And it's just an incredible benefit and uh, an opportunity. On the other hand, though, if you don't come up to scratch, I'm going to crucify you. They're very extreme, aren't they? When you think of the, the alternatives of the judgment seat, we're talking very extreme outcomes, eternal life or eternal death. Very extreme. Now, what... How's your heart going as you're thinking about, as you're about to face, this is, this is now the end of your tenure and I'm about to give you the verdict as to whether you're going to be crucified, alive, in pain and agony, or you're going to have your own farm, freedom, all that. It's, it's a pretty crucial decision, isn't it? Yes, he's saying yes. It's, he's nodding just for those at the back. 
Okay. How this judgment will go will be significantly different depending on which book I start with. I've got this book here called The Book of Lives, which has everything that you've done while you've worked for me. I've been watching, I've got cameras out there, I've got people spying me. So I've got everything you've done all recorded in this book. I'm going to talk to you about that. This book here, if your name's in it, you, you get the reward. You get to you know, live on this beautiful property and marry and have children and have this wonderful thing. If your name's not in it, out the back now, you're going to be crucified. Pretty extreme. You imagine the feelings and the emotions if I start with the book of lives. Okay, day one. Yes, you did a good job. You swept the yard. All very good. You're going, boom, 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 boom. This is good. Oh, you did a good job sweeping the yard. Boom, 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 boom. However, I noticed that you slackened off about five minutes early and went and laid down in the shed. Boom, 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 boom. It's, 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 it's all starting to get ter terrified here. If you think of the, the outcome of this interview, would he really hear anything I said? Really? He'd be absolutely mortified. He would really be wanting to hear the final verdict. Would he? He's really not listening to a lot of the stuff I'm saying. You know, I noticed that you did a good job on you know, preparing for that feast we had at New Moon, but I noticed you pinched a couple of the prawns that were on the plate that were there. Whatever, whatever. Okay. So we're going up and down. There's this, this emotional roller coaster that he's experiencing as, as we go through this process. I don't think he's really taking a lot of this in. If I just switch the process around and I say, your name is in the book of life. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, shake hands, hug, whatever. Well done. However, I have somewhat against you. I want to talk about some of the things you did that were good, and I want to talk about some of the things that you didn't do that, was, that, that, that you should have done, and I want to talk about, and this is for you because you're about to be a slave owner yourself. You're about to have a farm. You're about to have people working for you. You're going to be in charge of people, in charge of people's lives. You're going to be responsible for taking the ethos of my farm and, and replicating it over there. So I'm going to go through this with you, and I want to explain where, where, you've, where you could have done better and... Do you think that's a, that's a better outcome? Yes, okay, he's happier, happier with that one. Okay, that's just been a, a little example of, just a, just a little example of the, what I think the concept of the judgment seat is. It's an education process to make us fit for the bestowal of immortality and eternal life. And those things have to, have to be dealt with. So we're accepted or rejected, sheep and the goats separated, but we still need to receive feedback from our Lord, which could be in, the, in some cases the format of praise, but for many of us, as all of us, we know there's going to be a lot of things that the Lord is not, not pleased with. I raised on the, the first night the, the quote from James 3, talking about don't be many teachers because you are going to come into stricter judgment. And I said, why would you be a teacher? Why would you be a teacher in the truth? If your prospects of eternal life are minimized and reduced because you're a teacher, you're going to get a stricter judgment. You would be mad to be a teacher in the truth if, that, if that's the case. But I think, you know, and it's inconsistent with other quotes that say, um, you know, uh, he that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing, and a bishop must be apt to teach. So, uh, so it seems to be contradictory there. But it's, it's not saying that your, um, the prospect of, being, of eternal life is going to be stricter and, and, and the... And the the bar's going to be raised for, to receive eternal life. It's saying the Lord expects more from you because of your knowledge and the fact that you, you, you have an insight into his word and, and his principles and therefore he's going to hold you to account in that, in that process as he educates you uh, in, in, in a more intense and stricter way than he may do with, with someone else, so, you know, a sister whose husband's not in the truth and she faithfully attends when she can or, or whatever the case might be. So, so we start to make sense of a lot of these little verses and, and transactional type uh, statements that are made about the judgment seat, which, which I hope help us. So, we are accepted or rejected based on grace, based on our covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are in the book of life, the sheep or the goats, those who I know you or I never knew you. We give account based on the works that we have done, our motives are examined, and we'll talk about this on Sunday as well. Uh, our inner man is revealed and the Lord will, will, will look at that and provide us a feedback on that. And then we receive praise, admonition and rewards. And our character is perfected and we are 
then able to be presented faultless in the full sense of that word uh, with exceeding joy. So I might call it there, Brother Chairman. Thank you.